This two-year series is dedicated to Emeritus Professor um, Andrew Levitt, who retired at the end of the summer term. As the lecture series committee developed the theme and speakers for the sequence, we realized that Andrew had spent his tenure at Waterloo teaching about care and exercising a great deal of care in this work. Andrew's attention to the emotional well being of his students was one inspiration for the founding of the Waterloo Student Group on Empathy. Lecture series committee member Jalia Fonseca points out that. Andrew was a huge supporter of On Empathy from its inception and would frequently contribute to the group through talks and seminars. He has shared presentations and held mindfulness exercises with many student groups at the school over the years. As a faculty member, I've also been so impressed by the role that On Empathy has played in the social well being of the school and inspiring other related student groups, such as Treaty Lands Global Stories and the Sustainability Collective. Andrew has been a strong faculty support for this extracurricular life, which has been pushing school culture to value social relations between people rather than between commodified things. Thanks so much to Ariscraft for funding the speaker series and to the Faculty of Engineering's Distinguished International Visiting Scholar Program for funding tonight's speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce Ella Den Elson. Ella is an architectural designer and researcher. She holds a Bachelor of Architectural Studies from the University of Waterloo and a Master's of Architecture from McGill University. Her practice engages with modes of architectural representation to explore the role of architecture in relation to justice. Her research examines topics linked to migration, spaces of incarceration, and settler colonial infrastructures. She, is current, she currently works as a curatorial assistant at the Canadian Centre for Architecture on exhibition projects and is co-teaching our school's architectural theory course. Welcome, Ella. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and so I would just like to begin um, this evening's event um, by saying that tonight we'll be discussing property, um, the oppression that it causes, um, as well as futures that can exist beyond um, its construction. Uh, and as Adrian already noted, this series itself embraces notions of care, and how we can begin to think um, in closer relationship to other beings. Um, that being said, I want to acknowledge that the practice of architecture is inherently entangled with planning processes and the private ownership of property. Architecture takes place on land, um, often through processes of displacement um, and dispossession on both unceded and treaty territories. Embedded within the practice of, it, of design itself are colonial tools such as surveying and measured drawing, which have enabled and continue to enable the appropriation of Indigenous land and ways of life, which directly contribute to the spatial inequalities we see today, both in urban and rural space. The notion of private land ownership um, was one that was imported um, to what is now known as Canada through colonial occupation. I would like to acknowledge the many nations who are the original inhabitants and caretakers of these lands and waters, which is now home to many diverse First Nations and Métis peoples, um, both on the land which the University of Waterloo occupies and across Turtle Island. The School of Architecture itself is situated on the Haldeman Track, a swath of land 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. This land was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River, and is within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. Um, tonight, we are all connecting from across the world, from territories, each with their own histories and stories. I myself am calling in from the unceded territory, tor, tor, sorry, territory of the Ginyakahaga Nation, um, also known as Jagjage Munye, um, or Montreal. And so I am now very pleased uh, to introduce our two guests this evening, um, Ronaldo Walcott, and Tandy Lowenson. Uh, Ronaldo is a professor in Black Diaspora Cultural Studies in the Women and Gender Studies Institute, University of Toronto. He is the author of The Long Emancipation, Moving Towards Black Freedom, um, published by Duke University Press in 2021, and On Property, published by Biblioasis in 2021. The latter was shortlisted for the Toronto Book Award. Tandy Lowenson is an architectural designer and researcher who mobilizes design, fiction, and performance to stoke embers of emancipatory political thought and fires of collective action, and to feel for the contours of other possible worlds. Using fiction as a design tool and tactic and operating in the overlapping realms of the weird, the tender, the earthly, and the airborne, Tandy engages in pro projects which provoke 
the questioning of the status quo whilst working with communities, policymakers, unions, artists, and architects towards acting on those provocations. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Renaldo. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you, Julie. Thank you um, to Waterloo Architecture for inviting me to be in conversation with Tandy tonight. Um, <clears throat> I want to, to spend my time um, just giving some sense of what lied behind the argument that I made in on property for the abolition of property and for the articulation of a new ethic of care. And I wanna do that by way of um, observations and examples that are not in the book, but inform how I came to some of the ideas that are in the book, especially around um, public space, private space, as those things bleed into property. So there are about three or four of, there are three of them. And then I'll say some things about um, the question of social life as I, as, I go, as I go on. So the first is that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, I, I lived in the gay village in Toronto. And this, this talk, I should say, it's, it's in, in many ways very local, but I, but I think, not I think, I know that it has, um, these local examples have global, um, global corollaries. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, I lived um, on the edges of the gay village in Toronto, spent a lot of time in the gay village. And one of the things that um, happened then um, was that as men would come out of the bars and the dance clubs at night, um, they would have sex behind the 519 Church Street Center next to the AIDS Memorial, which had um, a landscaping that was um, thick growth, vines and trees, short trees, and no significant lighting. Um, people in the community complained about this public sex, and eventually the trees were winnowed down and spotlighting was brought into place. Similarly, on the David Goodman Trail, on the strip, um, on Cherry Beach in Toronto on the north side, um, in the summer times, um, there was thick brush, trees, so on. Men had created trails in between them, and those were places of significant public sex. Eventually, um, that area was shrewd and the trails disappeared, making it um, easily visible to see what was going on over there. Um, at the University of Toronto, where I work and where I studied, um, it was well known that at Innes College and University College, um, the basement washrooms were places where men crews for sex. Um, those bathrooms were redesigned so that the doors were taken away and couldn't be closed and a kind of curvature um, to the bathroom was introduced instead. Um, for those of you who live in Toronto, you will know that there's a perpetual um, ongoing renovation of Queen's Park meant to interrupt late night public sex. And um, if you're in Toronto and you want to see another aspect of what I just spoke to, the artist Abby Osman has a show up at the Gay and Lesbian Archives or the Archives that runs until November 3rd called Shadow Boxing, best viewed after dark. It's a projection um, with voice over commentary of men talking about how they need to use these parks and other places for sex. I begin there because I think that one of the things that I learned from those, from, 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 from those remakings 
was the manner in which urban space can be redesigned to interrupt forms of sociality. And, and by redesigning urban space to interrupt forms of sociality, that's mutually, it is redesigned in a fashion, um, particularly to interrupt forms of sociality by um, people who are deemed to be outside of the norm in some way. Of course, um, Samuel Delaney's fantastic book, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, documents the way in which um, public sex places in New York City um, were, were, really, were, were literally disappeared as, as Times Square became Disneyfied um, in the time, in, 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 in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s. So that's, that's the first kind of observation. The second observation I wanna make then is what does it mean then to own your body? Um, what does it mean? What does space and what does space have to do with that? And part of what I'm gonna suggest that from, from, from that first set of examples, but what I see is the space is configured and the space is configured and the built environment is shaped so that we experience our bodies in very particular ways. So the winnowing out of these trees, the constant um, renovation of Queens Park means that um, gay men cannot experience their bodies in particular kinds of ways in the public sphere late at night. Um, and that in and of itself has an impact on sociality. Um, it has an impact on how people feel the space. And it has an impact on whether or not people feel comfortable in the space or not, on whether or not they feel they can own the space. So landscaping in this instance works to convey a particular narrative of what kind of society we want to live in. And it works to produce a particular kind of regime and order, meaning that somehow pub public sex, late night public sex becomes anatomy. The other thing that I've been observing over a, a long period of time um, and, and that informs um, the, 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 the ideas in the book is to think about things like bus shelters and sidewalks and in bank machine foyers, these kinds of things. One of the things that, for instance, we, we notice in the redesigns of bus shelters in Toronto is that, for instance, the, the seating in them is very small. The walls of these bus shelters don't go all the way to the ground, which means that rainwater can pass through them, um, which means that people who are on house can't live in them. Um, there's no heating in them. And all of these are design, design structures that are meant to shape a particular social relationship uh, to the public space. Many of you will, will, will remember that, for example, bank machines used to be in foyers. And uh, many bank machines now sit on flat walls outside. And if they're bank machines in a foyer, they're usually only accessible between quote unquote standard business hours. We know that many, many of these design, um, these redesigns were made so that again, homeless people could not seek shelter in, in these foyers. On the other hand, we get something like the redesign of sidewalks, um, sidewalks that then are made lower so that people who are blind or people who use chairs can negotiate the landscape much easier. But we also know that it folded in that potentially um, good redesign of sidewalks is also the attempt to not create sidewalks too tall where in particular men can sit on street corners and hang out and so on. So there's these kinds of um, payoffs one against the other. And so I've been thinking a lot about the manner in, in, in which urban built space and environment then shapes particular kinds of social consequences, particular kinds of social practices. Um, how, for example, you know, um, in global cities, the vertical building 
going on the derivative of the condo, but I'm just going to call them apartments. You know, if you look at apartments largely built in the 60s or the 70s or, early, or even early 80s, there's almost no space for what we now call concierge, which is really private police. Um, but almost everything built in the 90s and the 2000s, um, very few buildings are not built without the space made for, um, for vertical police. And in fact, it's offered up as a, as a moment of luxury. But what it is, is it's an, an, interiorized, an interiorization of policing as a measure of security and so on. And part of what I'm suggesting is that that shapes a social and it shapes a relationship to property. It shapes a relationship to land. It shapes a relationship to ownership. It shapes, for example, who feels that they belong can enter. Um, and it shapes how they actually enter. Do you enter with a knowing sense of where you're headed or do you enter with a hesitation um, and so on and so forth? The, the other thing that I want to point to it by way of examples that, that sits behind um, the logics in the book is the ubiquity of the coffee shop in contemporary urban space. And, and part of what I, I've come to realize is that the coffee shop exceeds more than the latte and the pastry, that it belongs to a kind of new sociality. And this new sociality is a really profound sociality because the coffee shop oscillates between the public and the private. That all of the public places, spaces that have been usurped, um, that have been devolved, that governments have withdrawn from looking after have really reverted into the coffee shop. But the coffee shop is also, it remains a private space because one enters it at the cost of the latte, at the cost of the croissant. And if you can't afford the latte or the croissant, the social consequences of the coffee shop as public space um, are, are therefore eroded for you. So part of what I'm thinking and was thinking about as I wrote on property and, and was thinking about the abolition of property uh, was to think about the ways in which, um, I'm going to use this phrase, but neoliberal governments have eviscerated public spaces and colluded with um, private corporate enterprise to privatize more and more and more space. And so on the line that then is for me um, a sense of the, the ongoing devolution of what we might call a public good. Um, so that the public good is disappeared as these redesigns along the urban happens. Um, that what disappears isn't simply, you know, gay men being able to have sex out in the wild. Um, what disappears isn't um, young men being able to hang out on the street corner. But what disappears is uh, particular kinds of sociality that are then turned into a different kind of regime of order. And so all of this brings me then to this kind of idea of a new ethic of care. So in property, in, on property, when I write of a new ethic of care, what I wanted to convey is what would it mean to create ways of living that demonstrate a kind of ethical commitment to those whom we might assume we share nothing in common with. And that particular phrasing of, comes from the, the, the anthropologist Alfonso Lingus, and um, for those whom we share nothing in common with. And I, but I, I put it assume we share nothing in common with, because I think that, that we do share something in common with people we think we share nothing in common with. And so this, what, so what would the ethic of care be? First, I want to do a caution, which is to say that um, the sociologist Tamara Napa has recently been raising um, questions and concerns around how um, we deploy the term care within abolitionist discourse. And she wants us to pay attention to the fact that there's also people who do care work as labor. And I would add to, to Napa's caution that many of those people who do care work as labor 
are actually unable to own homes, to, to afford public transit, healthcare, to even enter sometimes the very coffee shops that now constitute the public realm, right? Having said that, the reason that um, I observe these things and that I think about them is that I think, what would it mean when we endeavor to imagine and to build a new social commons? Um, how will we be able to convince people that what they have now in theorized as the public good is actually not that? And so for me then the question that all of these, what, what becomes really clear to me is that in every instance of these particular kind of landscape redesigns, um, architectural redesigns and so on, that what all of these designs work against is the possibility of collectivity. And so for me, care has to be founded in collectivity. It has to be founded in equitable redistributions. It has to be, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore would say, it has to remake, we have to remake everything. And so if we return then to this notion of what it would mean to remake everything, for me, care then has to function with the, with the question that might appear simple, but for me, it's a deep philosophical question of how do we live better collectively together? That, that this, this notion of care is less one of emotionality, less one of, um, of, of, it is indeed somewhat psychic, but less one in this moment of a psychic reality and one of work pedagogically thinking through and working through, how might we live better collectively together? And that to me is a task that requires us then to make another leap, which is to think about what kinds of values we will need to build that are outside of the logic of capital. Because in many ways, all of the examples that I just gave are also very much tied to capital. Right. If men can't cruise next to the, the AIDS monument, which for many of us, I would articulate as a kind of life affirming thing that if sexuality was in one moment tied to death, to celebrate sexuality next to a monument that is tied to death is to celebrate life. Um, so new, a new set of values need to be um, worked towards. And for me, this means then that we work towards a kind of new global commons, a kind of reclaiming of, if you will, the territory both at the level of geography and at the level of our understanding of what it would mean to live better collectively together. I hope I didn't ramble too much and we can talk about this in more detail at question time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renato. Uh, I'm now going to pass it off to Tandy. Sure. I mean, how how am I supposed to follow <laughs> such like a <laughs> powerful incision? That's that was incredible. Thank you, Ronaldo. And just to echo the thanks again to to everyone at Waterloo, to Ella, to Adrian. Um, for facilitating this really amazing session. We are really blessed, uh, especially myself, I feel. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, yeah, and I think uh, obviously I'm, a, I'm, you know, I was sharing this earlier before everybody joined the Zoom, but I've devoured this, I've devoured this pamphlet. I've devoured a lot of Ronaldo's writing and I think, um, I think there's a lot that we can we can work with, we can learn from, we can be nourished by in architecture, and and I'm going to touch on some of the ways in which um, I think I think we can do that quite tangibly. And and um, uh, I was like nodding vigorously. I was, if you could have heard me, I was cheering Ronaldo. <laughs> I think um, there's going to be a lot of resonance in what I'm saying. Um, and and I think thank you also for for starting so beautifully from such a situated place and and I think I should also acknowledge that too. So you know I'm 
I'm a Zimbabwean. I'm currently based in London at the moment, where I teach at the Royal College of Art. Um, and a lot of my work is based and, and is located um, politically, ethically, and geographically in, in Southern Africa. And so that's that's the sort of place that I'm speaking to and coming coming from um, in this in this conversation. And I am also uh, an architectural designer. I'm very much steeped in the discipline. So the discipline, and I, and I use that word discipline with intention. Um, in the discipline, architectural care is typically conceived of in terms of conservation. So often legally mandated, highly regulated acts of maintenance, tending to the preservation, the sustaining of historic buildings or areas of the built environments of significance. And this of course begs the question of who is determining what constitutes significance and, and we know this to follow dominant hegemonic lines. Apologies for this slide. A casual glance at the shenanigans unfolding at Oxford University over the demand, the very reasonable demand to remove the statue of the white supremacist genocidal murderer Cecil John Rhodes from the facade of the grade two listed Rhodes building at Oriel College offers some clues of the tenacity with which these ideas of preservation are held and the legal and regulatory architectural frameworks which with, with which they are policed and of the world orders that they act in service of, or I could say enact violence in the cause of. And of course, less prominent are, are acts of caretaking, taking of care, picking up the rubbish, cleaning the corridors, checking on the neighbors, repairing, stitching, chipping the gum off the walls and so on and so on. Um, nor those, as Ronaldo calls us to, to, to consider, um, those who undertake this physical, emotional, reproductive and domestic labor. And I'm speaking about it here on, this, on the kind of intimate scale, but this occurs on the scale of cities, of countries, of whole regions of the world too. So just consider the moving infrastructure that is the Boda Boda, the Boda Boda, the East African network of motorcycle drivers that issues borders, sustaining intimate economies of enormous scale between Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda. Rather than purely acts of preserving or holding in stasis, these acts of care require speculation, they require anticipation. And this is nothing short of revolutionary. The idea that the spatial work we do now is not solely for preserving the conditions of the past, but in preparation for a future, better world to come, and indeed one which may already be here. So in On Property, uh, Ronaldo Walcott writing about the Haitian revolution draws a line between revolution beautifully described in the pamphlet and pertinent for, us, pertinent for us here as taking one's freedom and the project of abolition, showing that abolition, showing that abolition must be central to any real revolutionary project. And similarly, Walcott draws our attention to the tools within the oppressive arsenal which are meted out in response to the threat that conjoined abolition revolution poses and which must be seen as imbricated within systems of policing and incarceration too. So drawing on the example of Haiti in, in the, in, on property, this took and this continues to take um, the form of direct economic violence. As Walcott writes, Though the French couldn't defeat the Haitians on the ground, the fledgling country was nevertheless severely punished for its rebellion with an international blockade. So here we see um, global geopolitical networks socially and spatially mobilized in the protection of a violent and repressive world order. And this also occurs as indirect economic violence. So that the incredible example of the coffee shop that we've just heard or the reshaping through these subtle design moves um, but the imbrication of almost every aspect of life with particular structures of capital, such that it is almost impossible to imagine how this can be disentangled. So again, as Walcott writes, and apologies for slightly para paraphrasing here, just think for a minute about the enormous amount of money that is spent on policing in Canada or the United States or wherever it is that you're hearing this. One thing these enormous figures explain abundantly is why it's so difficult for us, for so many to conceive of a world without police. And so here, and I think this is really central um, to us as architects, the idea of policing, of crime and punishment is extended to a whole carceral apparatus. 
including prisons, but also the functions and performance and expectations of the good and correct functioning of economies, of states, of how land must be occupied and how people must be organized in relation to one another. And as this example of Rhodes shows, architecture is deeply complicit within this, constructing rules of who is ordered as in and out, who can feel welcome, who is and who is fortunate to have just made it into this space, um, and how they're continually reminded by that in, in these subtle moves, but the very overt moves, as we know. Um, how, must one, how one must behave within these spaces um, and the political and economic infrastructure through which space can be pro procured, built, sustained and reproduced. It also importantly pervades our imagination, giving shape and form to the world and what can be deemed or even dreamed possible within it. So I'm going to talk about architecture as a world-making and deeply political practice. And I'm going to take you back just a bit to the late 1960s um, to a really existing project of property abolition in Zambia and the social and spatial realms of care and caretaking that it conjured. And because abolition and the world it is building is an ongoing project, revolution here has not been uncontested. So I'm going to speak about some of the ways that this abolition is met with violence too, because it's important to understand as Walcott shows us in relation to Haiti, the tools and tricks of genocidal racial capitalism's response to abolition in order to better understand and contend with them going forward. So we start in the, in the capital of Zambia, Lusaka. And as I said, I'm from Harare, from Zimbabwe, but I'm speaking to you now from London. And so Lusaka has now become something of a third home to me. And it's a really fascinating place for so many reasons. And I think a great example for us to engage these questions. Lusaka's ground is full of holes, but instead of reading these holes as absence and vacuum, I seek here to engage in a close reading of the contours of these holes. And this is going to be an excavation of sorts. And because digging into the earth is itself a kind of time travel in which layers of the past and the present and the future are disturbed in the process, Fittingly then, this excavation is going to move somewhat anarchically through time, so bear with me, and I invite you to sit with me at once in the long now of geological formation, then in the 60s and 70s in a newly independent socialist Zambia, and then a few decades later during the economic, social and epistemic violence of systems of structural adjustment and then austerity. Somehow, we are, of course, also in 2021, having recently this year buried Kenneth Kaunda, who was the first president of Zambia, and in the words of the writer and the critic Percy Jomuya, the last surviving symbol of the era of high nationalism in Southern Africa. When we dig down, we're confronted with the most recent material first, which can seem either strange and confusing. You know, how did we get here? Why is it this way? But it can also seem inevitable, as though this is the way that things have always been and will likely be into the future. And I hope to pierce a very large hole into this notion here. So Lusaka's ground is full of holes. Meta limestones and dolomitic marbles, quartzites, granite and kyanite schist. It is riddled with faults, sudden disjunctions in the layers of the earth which set time and matter out of joint, leaving folds and hinges and slippages where clean lines of progress should be. These rocks form an underground terrain of caverns connected by uneven tunnels. This is a subterranean topography known as cast. Over time, holes in this cast ground have joined together, producing a vast underground network of sinkholes and cavities, extending 25 meters below the ground and storing all of the city's water. Every so often, the layer of soil which typically conceals this subterranean landscape completely disappears. It's washed away or it's removed by hand, revealing a forest of white stone figures huddled together below the surface. Within their ranks, urban miners have found potential, quarrying the stone for aggregate to feed the concrete production of this ever-growing city. Young men and children pile waste and logs and tires into these holes and set them alight, taking turns to stoke the fire, which softens the rock, and then later they'll pour in cold water, the temperature shock, splintering large fragments off the stone. And these are painstakingly crushed, as you see here in, in this um, kind of very common ubiquitous piece of architecture that you'd see in the city at the side of the road, typically by older women and sold in bags of tiny stone pieces for almost negligible amounts relative to the huge amount of collective labor involved. 
this is violent work, leaving required to fuel the construction of the city, but leaving in its wake blackened, jagged stone and discarded packets of single shot alcohol. Elsewhere in the city, wealthier residents have further pierced the earth by plunging thousands of boreholes into the ground, drawing up water for their individual household use and taking advantage of weak regulation favoring the private sector and the erosion of public services by enforced privatization and liberalization imposed on Zambia by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in the 90s, which I think can be read as a direct attack on the abolition of pro abolitionist project of Zambian independence, and there's more on this to come. Rumours abound of another series of excavations, a network of secret underground tunnels and bunkers built between 1974 and 76 by Energo project engineers sent to Zambia by former Yugoslav leader Josep Broz Tito, then a close friend of uh, President Kaunda. So the Energo project engineers had been publicly contracted to help construct a number of buildings in preparation for the 1970 summit of the non-aligned movement, which was held in Lusaka. Most notably, these included the Mulungushi International Conference Center, which you see here, which is just a spectacular piece of architecture, um, which was built to host the proceedings, and also Findeco House, which remains Zambia's tallest building. For many years, the tunnels were a secret, and they're still shrouded in some mystery today, so you'll note that you won't see any pictures of them as much as I have tried. <laughs> They were revealed in a bizarre twist in Zambian politics by Kaunda's successor, President Chiluba, and the tunnels are perhaps indicative of the fragility of the Zambian project then, and the infrastructures of defence and care for the movement that Kaunda had required during his time in office. So these took the form of large building projects, and here you see Findeco House, which is still a landmark in the city, which could both project strength and international support, both inwardly in the country and outwardly to opponents of the nationalist project. But as is revealed through these tunnels, this also took the form of architectural projects, which could very tangibly support the need to defend it against more barefaced forms of attack. At the time, Kawanda supporters described the tunnels as a security upgrade of the presidential palace, part of a bomb-proof command and control bunker, built for the country in the event of an attack from the hostile apartheid South African regime, with living quarters, a broadcasting station, meeting rooms, and a weapons store. If you follow Great North Road, turning left after Mount Meru uh, filling station, you will come to yet another opening. So here at the Chunga landfill, decades of accumulating city waste piles up, creating a constantly shifting landscape of discarded matter. It is perhaps the city's largest hole, a pit of the discarded every day. And some sources have it that this was once the site of the headquarters of the independence era Zambian space program, led by um, a veteran of the Zambian nationalist movement struggle, Director General Edward Festus Mukuka and Colosso. Through the space program, Colosso constructed a rigorous and inventive training course, which included rope swings and repurposed oil barrels used to simulate anti-gravity conditions and class-based study of physics and interstellar bodies. The space program was equipped with several iterations of spacecraft and a team of specially trained astronauts led by a black woman, Martha Mwamba, and her deputy, Godfrey Mwango. And footage and accounts of cadets in training show that uh, Colosso's program was taken very seriously. And that this space program was unfolding against the backdrop of Zambian independence is pertinent. As Namwali Seppel has written about beautifully, and Colossal's work throughout his life was closely associated with an active struggle for the emancipation of black people from capitalist colonial control in the region, which constructed black Africans as inhuman subjects. In part, this was done, um, as Brenna Bandar writes, through the regime of proper occupation and utilization of land, established through regimes of enclosure and privatization, um, both of land and property, and the attendant racialized category of whiteness. And this was used both to convey by whom this proper land use was conceived and to whom this, this was made available. The inhumanity of Black Africans was also established through their framing in this, in this capitalist and colonial project as raw material, not people, but rather matter to be extracted of value through, the subject, through subjugation and through the exploitation of their productive and reproductive labor and the theft of their land through colonial expansion. 
So it stands to reason that alongside the space program in seeking to make a break from colonialism, the newly independent Zambian government led by Kaunda undertook a series of economic and social reforms that would radically restructure relations between people, property and the earth. Through the abolition of private property and the nationalization of the mines, the country's land and minerals were no longer matter for generating profit, but rather matter that had the means to enrich the lives and futures of the Zambian population. Zambia then was one of the world's top four copper producers and, and was an enormous source of mineral wealth. And despite independence having been achieved four years prior, the country's mines were still being held under foreign control and in the hands of former colonial and imperial powers. So the economic reforms that were initiated by Kawunda in a declaration at Mulungushi Rock, which was a key site in the struggle for Zambian independence and another hole of sorts, 10 kilometers north of Broken Hill Mine, which was the country's first kind of colonial mineral site of colonial mineral extraction. Mulungushi Rock played host to the political gatherings which led to the format formation of the socialist anti-colonial movement. Um, in front of crowds seated on the ground, President Kaunda declared, quote, political independence without matching economic independence is meaningless. It is economic independence that brings in its wake social, cultural and scientific progress. No doubt political independence is key, but only the key to the house that we must build. So this nationalization project, uh, which followed initially supported this project of house building. And there are astonishing examples of the kinds of conjoined political and architectural projects of taking freedom, of taking care, which I think Walcott opens our minds to in the, to the possibility of in on property. And these included government investments in public health and education infrastructure, the construction of the, of the University of Zambia campus, which is this incredible series of structures that we see here, the University Teaching Hospital in Zambia, and thousands of free schools and colleges and district hospitals throughout the country. So these were, these were really special architectural projects and were, were treated as such. And, and this is an incredible space, which I just want to tell you a little bit about that once you, it, it, it kind of looks like this quite bunker like space, but once you enter it, this series of louvers creates this flood of light and openness in, in the space, which is quite um, incredible and unusual for a hospital space, which we typically think of as something sanitized, something to which you retreat um, and something which is, is actually policed in many ways too. So, a state mining conglomerate was also formed, which shifted the agenda of the mining industry from extraction and externalization towards social provision for the country's citizens. And that was plowed into infrastructural and architectural projects of collective and social care, which we see. Now, working towards the same ends, the concurrent Zambian space program required of Zambians to craft a narrative in which black people were themselves no longer seen as resources, as minerals, and were not only free to flourish on earth, but could aspire to even greater heights too. And that this group of Zambian astronauts never made it into orbit is really ne neither here nor there. Arguably, um, the project was not solely concerned with leaving earth, nor was it preoccupied with a future emancipation. I put it that in conceiving of and constructing the program, Colossus project was already successful. And fittingly, the motto of the program was given in the present indefinite tense. Wherever fate and human glory are found, we are always there. This abolition is ubiquitous, occurring wherever. It has occurred and it will continue unceasingly into the future. The Zambian astronauts are always already there. Nkolosa died on the 4th of March 1989, and he was given a state funeral at the city's premier graveyard in uh, Leopards Hill Cemetery in the north of the city. And I ventured to the site hoping to find a stone, you know, something fixed and stable and tangible that I could hold on to from this moment. And the cemetery is beautiful, but as you see here, it is quite overgrown. And, and that is in part its beauty. <laughs> so I ended up enlisting the team of, of, of the grave diggers who, who work the site, who know the site. And we checked nearly every single state sponsored tombstone in gray, emblazoned with in memory of our comrade. But we quickly found that you have to be careful when moving through the cemetery. In some cases, caskets have been exhumed and only holes remain where freedom fighters have finally taken flight to countries of which only dreams existed when they had died. Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, South Africa. Following the boom and the bust of the global copper markets and the successive political interventions by the international finance institutions, the World Bank and the, and the IMF, as we speak, spoke about already before, 
which pushed a, a project of privatization and liberalization on the economy. We find that the social contract forged in the Kawanda years is now in tatters. I went back to the landfill to search for vestiges of the former space program. And come the rains and navigating this terrain is almost impossible. The high water table means that the landfill is quickly covered in a sticky mud and, and obscures the nature of, of um, collected materials. And this poses particular risks for the community of over 500 waste recyclers who operate on this site, digging and filtering and finding and for, uh, former vestigial objects into new matters of value. I study all this material that is being collected closely, hoping for the glimpse of a porthole of a rocket or a medallion or something, but nothing, nothing emerged. But instead, I found something much more impressive, much more exciting. A community who are organized at the Chungo, uh, known as the Chunga Waste Recyclers Association, who collectively are successfully agitating for their rights of access, of livelihood, of health and safety against the exclusionary forces that would seek to privatize this site and, and threaten their position. Um, women play a key role in the association and occupy leadership positions as a condition of the association's formation. And when a cholera outbreak hits the city, uh, the army is deployed to close the landfill in line with the region's increasingly militarized and policed responses to social and public health concerns. But the association was successful in lobbying for access to the site, in showing their humanity, their value to the wider social and material economy of the country and the city, and negotiating improved equipment to support safer working conditions on the site too. So despite appearances, this hole is far from the low end. Workers are here once again reconfiguring the material, metaphysical and social rules that they have been dealt, organizing and crafting resistance, abolition as imaginative projects which contend with injustice. We never find Colossal's grave and I am moved to wonder if it even exists. Instead, I prefer to follow the motto of the space program. Wherever fate and human glory are found, in Colossal, the Zambian astronauts, and all those who dream towards a life otherwise are always already there. It follows then that our work must be to put in the conjoined political, social, and spatial work of abolition dreaming too, and to actively supporting this work in all of the spaces that we find it is already flourishing today. Wow, thank you so much, Tandy. That was incredible. Also, well, thank you to both of you um, for all of your insights this evening. Um, I wanted to, um, yeah, no, I think there's just so many great overlaps between both of your presentations in terms of looking at the way um, space has been privatized, um, as you mentioned, through sort of neoliberal government um, in both these sites. And it's interesting to learn, um, especially in this example you just last showed, Tandy, that the privatization of um, the landfill um, or the way that people are resisting against that. Um, and similarly, Ronaldo, how you were talking about the privatization of spaces that should be um, ultimately public or what is sort of deemed public space and the way in which privatization really begins to kind of encroach upon that. Um, and so, I mean, before, maybe before I ask any questions, I wanted to just see if um, there are any audience questions um, and open up the, the floor. First, Tandy, that was a beautiful, beautiful paper. And thank you for engaging with my, my work in, 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 with such beautiful commentary. Your paper really made me think about whether or not there's something different between um, the kind of space in the metropolis that I'm thinking about and its reconfiguration and the, and the kind of ambiguous nature of, of public and private space vis-a-vis -vis, um, public space and monumental architectural post-colonial <laughs> um, figurations um, of, of space and the built environment. I, I just wanted to, um, that really struck me mm -hmm. as in, in, in terms of how you talked about those architectural projects as enfolding within them a different kind of possibility than, than, than what I was speaking to. I wonder if you want to reflect on that a little bit more because I found it fascinating. Yeah, and no, and th thank you so much. <laughs> like this is turning into a love-in, but I'm here for it. <laughs> thank you so much for, the, for this um, 
Incredible talk. And I think what I really loved is the, the shift in scales, but simultaneously the, the kind of continued threads, right? And I think yeah. that's perhaps an interesting place to start with this question that you, that you pose, that you put on the table for us, because I think I was also thinking a lot when I was reading your book, because it's it's also very much of a, of a place and of a particular geography. And I was thinking mm. about how, about operating with care, I suppose, for the kinds of readings and tra translations and perhaps transmutations of reading it from another context. But I think it's what the, where the, the kind of key of it, or the key kind of, one of the, 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 the real nuggets of it, I suppose, in, is in one of the questions that you posed at the beginning of your, of your paper just now, where you were talking about what does it mean to own your own body and what does space have to do with that? And I think that's, that's really the very central point of this work, right? Um, in, in the context that I'm speaking of, um, this is, a, this is a scenario in which the very nature of the body, of the, the construction of the human is so imbricated in a particular logic of um, construction of property and forms of architecture which are associated with that. And so to disrupt those forms of architecture requires both the monumental in terms of shifting the, the worldview or the imaginary of, of who and how we can occupy the world with the cascading effects of what that means for who is considered human within it. But I see exactly the same thing happening on a very intimate scale where you, when you talk about um, the, when you talk about the design of the toilet or of the sidewalk, right? I think in those very subtle shifts, there is a, a cascading scale of violence that is operating on that scale too, that is saying, you are not human, actually. You are not worthy or even capable of occupying space in the right way. And therefore it's not for you. This, this, is, not, this is not your world. And I think that sounds quite dramatic to say it in those terms, but I think that's fundamentally what's at the heart of, of this project. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is, um, so Lusaka itself, it's citing, um, is the result of a very carefully thought through urban design and architectural project that was about asserting colonial control of the crown in relation to private corporations. And that later kind of became a fuzzy kind of terrain, right? Um, but but in, those, in those documents, they describe how there was a settlement uh, at Lusaka and a settlement, an African settlement. Um, but the, the architecture that is there is described as, um, I always remember it because it's so horrific. Um, formless bungaloid growths, right? It's not even given the value of being described as a building. It's it's like it has to be corrupted, distorted, and turned into something horrific. Um, and and by association, its sociality is constructed as as horrific too. So I don't. I mean, do you do you see that as well? I think that that's such a common thread of of scale I think between the between the work yeah most most definitely I you know one of the things that I think a lot about is the transition from in in these metropolises where I am the transition from of the inner city in the 60s and the 70s from racialized and black to now being the financialized shiny vertical gated cities yeah. um, with private police and so on, right? So how one moves from monstrosity to a certain kind of late modern logic of civilization. Yeah. And for that to happen, all of those mark as less than human have to be emptied out of the downtown core. Yeah. Um, so, so we see the similar kinds of um, built landscape, and all of the kinds of social practices that comes along with it, um, marking who is human and who is not. Yeah. Um, and, and so how you inhabit that space has very much to do with the quality of your humanity and yeah. very, much to, very much to do with the quality of the social life that you might have. So, you know, yeah. a re-energized, a refinancialized, um, a reinvented city core yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it's often a city court that's, that is in juxtaposition to the lives of Black people, people of color, Indigenous yeah. people, working class people, poor queer people, and so on. So, yeah. yeah. I think there's also something really interesting um, in that, in the, in the way that that's usually preceded and attended to by the manufacture of crisis or the uh, conditions of crisis, right? That, mm-hmm. um, and, and they never go away, despite the redesign that <laughs> is intended to make it better, right? Because it yeah. thrives <laughs> off the fact of there the crisis, being yeah. crisis and fear and... and um, Sure, what a way to live is that, <laughs> that this, <laughs> exactly. this, these forms and these, and these societal relations rely on uh, catastrophe. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, maybe if I could jump in with a question that's sort of linked, I think, to what both of you are discussing right now um, in terms of this the mechanisms by which design um, kind of exercises itself. And I know, um, Ronaldo, you talked about um, the way in which urban space has been designed to interrupt forms of sociality. Um, And I think one overlap, I guess, I've noticed with Tandy's work, just from what you've shared with me previously, is that often I think you point out sometimes the limits of um, design thinking or maybe kind of... um, not, I mean, I think, I think you see it some, as world be- building, but I think also sometimes um, the way in which um, pedagogical approaches in sort of like traditional form are often um, limiting. And like you mentioned, um, you, you, you're interested in sort of um, narratives and storytelling um, and alternative approaches to practice. And so I guess my question for both of you is, um, how do you see um, the potential for uh, either design or other forms of practice to um, work as forms of collective care, as you call it, and sort of work towards a new ethics of care? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead first, thing. Um, thank you, Ella. This is such an important question to contend with in an architectural school. Um, and, and I'd be really interested to hear if there are students here, if they, if they have responses to that and how they perceive that as well, kind of coming up into the discipline. Um, and yeah, maybe that's a good place to start actually with that somewhat cheeky provocation I started with about disciplinarity. <laughs> and <laughs> I think certainly in my own practice, but um, I, I was laughing with my partner before I came on because I think I've never really shown this many um, examples of buildings in presentation. It's not my style. So I got this like thrill from it as an architect to be finally doing that. Um, and I think that, that part of that is down to the fact that I think we need a very much more expanded idea of what constitutes design, what constitutes architectural practice. Um, and that, that is uh, a really exciting thing, but often uh, conjures up this anxiety within the architecture school of like, will this meet the learning outcomes? Can we pass this project? Um, but we need to be really brave and courageous with how we're considering that. Um, and I, I go back to um, one of the points that you made, Ronaldo, about um, Tamara Napa's work, about care work as labor and how that extends our idea of um, what is the work that produces the kinds of change that we would like to see and the change that uh, the change that is you know facilitating and supporting and building these these abolitionist projects and I think similarly we have to do the same kind of um, rupturing of architecture as a discipline and say what is the kind of spatial practice that constitutes uh, and that develops these kinds of ruptures in what we think of as um, uh, the, the, the good and proper occupation of space um, uh, that, that includes and excludes particular forms of space making and, and attendant forms of race making and so and there's a lot of people doing really exciting work in this you know looking at um, the way sound um, and, and sound practices within marginalized communities as, as a form of space making or looking at performative practices or um, narrative practices, you know. Um, 
so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that as a, as a potential for design. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess what I'm thinking about is how can the built environment and space be deployed to produce new forms of sociality, new ways of being together? And um, what kinds of designs might be imagined that allow for us to come together in difference outside of hierarchy? So, you know, in many of the buildings that I traverse, you know, to it's almost impossible to find, say, cleaning equipment. So you can only know where the cleaning equipment is if you are in a particular position, if you're working in janitorial services. And janitorial services get gendered and racialized and find themselves at the bottom of a hierarchy. If I take that as an example, I start thinking like, you know, what would it mean to create spaces where janitorial labor and by extension, the people who do it don't become invisible? Yeah. Um, and so, so, so those are the kinds of things that I think demand of us new kinds of values about what we think is important, um, the demand of us thinking differently about the hierarchical nature of labor. And one of the reasons I, I really wanted to invoke um, Tamara Napper and her caution around how we deploy care in abolitionist discourse is because she really wants us to think about how labor that is marked as care labor, like people working in long-term care homes, mm -hmm. nurses, and so on, how that labor also finds itself in a certain kind of not only devaluation, but also devolution. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, we know that we're in the midst of a significant global health crisis, but the poor wages and working conditions of nurses and personal care workers and so on means that people are leaving those professions. And so the kind of question then is, what kind of new values of collective caring can we muster up yeah. that would make that kind of labor, the kind of significantly valued and compensated labor that people would not have to flee it um, at a, in this time of crisis. And that to me, it seems to calls for a whole reorder of how we've understood what it means to live a life. So ultimately for me, the kind of question is, what kinds of spaces and built environments can we create and imagine that allow us to live the fullest possible lives that might be available to us? I think that's so powerful. And I, I think um, there's something really key in what you're saying about the role of design, the role of architecture and acknowledging that um, architects don't always build as well. Um, in making visible and the rupture that actually just being making visible um, can do um, to, to kind of disrupting those hierarchies. I think that's, yeah, that's a really incredible and powerful point. Yeah, it just makes me think a bit about how you um, first began your presentation when I think you were talking about this notion of um, interiorized policing that happens within condominium complexes, but then also mm. I think you began with this question about how do you enter? And I think this idea of entering space, visibility, um, but also um, yeah, how people feel within a space um, and sort of the inclusion or exclusion of certain bodies um, is really kind of at the heart of this conversation today. Um, I do wanna open it up again to, in case there's any remaining questions, um, just because we only have about five minutes left. So if there is anybody in the audience that has a question, um, now's the time to pose it to our guests. I think we have, we have until 7.30, I think. Oh, my, my apologies, sorry. Hi. Okay, that was, I was told um, I had a different, Okay, sorry about that. Um, so then, yes, okay, then we have much more time. Uh, <laughs> no, I had some, some how I had 7.15, so I was a bit concerned. Okay. Uh, 
maybe if if I can, um, I think there's. Yeah. I really love the introdu- introduction of um, a new commons that, that you mm-hmm. brought to us, um, and I think there's something that part of the kind of uh, really sticky architectural questions at the moment <laughs> is about. Um, uh, the pressure that architecture is putting on our global environment. And I think that um, those questions tend to play out in terms of material use, kind of carbon use, carbon sequester, and so on, and less so in terms of um, the kind of interconnectedness of, of these struggles. You know, some of the points that we've been bringing up today about the, the way that these operate in very similar ways and entangled ways across sites um, and I just wanted to open perhaps with a with a question around how we foster this kind of globalized commons of thinking around around these questions and um, yeah where you see the possibilities for that or the embers of that happening that we can engage with and build on yeah that's a great question one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is and especially because of this, this invitation in particular, I've been thinking a lot about, and, and this might prove my, my naivety about um, contemporary architecture and, and what's happening in, in the discipline, what debates are happening and so on. I've been thinking a lot about what would it mean for architecture to understand its work as fundamentally tied to planetary survival. Mm-hmm. And so to me, in my way of thinking, that would mean that architecture will have to concern itself with the project of what it means to design for the collectivity. And so in the interim, what would that look like? I mean, for me, what that begins to look like is how my architecture and urban design begin to think about um, the kinds of mass migrations that will probably ensue before we really fix um, the climate catastrophe that we're headed towards. Mm -hmm. So we know that for instance, in parts of the Caribbean and parts of Southeast Africa, that climate change is such that what we call rising seas, but what is is really the disappearing of land into water (laughs) and um, could could in fact induce um, a significant migration crisis well before the kind of measures that we need, um, that we require to to respond to the climate catastrophe. And so then I start thinking, okay, so what is happening in architecture that if suddenly large numbers of people have to move, how would they be housed? Um, Because one of the things that I think, what I was pointing to by pointing to vertical living and these kinds of things in spaces like ours is that in this very moment, what we see happening is a redefinition of what it means to be sheltered, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That um, the fact that, and that we can redesign what was once public space or that as happened in my city in Toronto recently, people who are already on house were evicted from parks. So people who were already evicted are evicted again. Mm. So we're seeing a redefinition of what it means to be re- to be evicted. Mm. And so for me, all of these bring us back to, to this apocalypse that seems to be haunting us, mm. that seems to be um, right behind our shoulders. And the kind of question is, what kind of built landscapes can we can we have where we don't see people have to, as happened in Katrina, head to the saddle dome in New Orleans, or, you know, um, what role does architecture play in, in, what, I, in, 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 in what is clearly, um, what can clearly, clearly be defined as a cultural issue for us right now? Um, mm-hmm. That climate change is not just scientific and not just political, mm-hmm. but it demands a kind of cultural attention that we might actually call care. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this example of the, I mean, how shocking is that? The, the removal of unhoused, unhomed people, uh, unhoused people from parks. Um, I think there's something really interesting about the, the intimate scale at which that plays out um, and a world in which something that is 
something like that is possible in your neighborhood is also a world in which the construction of a, of a wall as a border um, is also possible. Right. And so it's actually a, quite a, an empowering thing to, to contend with, um, to think that contending with those actually very localized issues can have these scalar effects that contend with much larger issues too. Um, I see Adrian has a question, so I will um, open the floor to him. Thanks so much um, for your talks, Tandy and Ronaldo. That was so inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question that comes out of the theory class that Ellen and I have been teaching. Um, we've been following uh, Brenna Bander's hypothesis that our task is to rethink the relationship between the modern liberal subject and property that begins with Locke through his theorization of a self-possessive individual subject. Um, which constructs a gendered and racialized concept of property that is in many ways still with us. Um, neoliberalism, I think, as you've pointed out, is a project that doesn't literally privatize everything because there still are universities that are publicly owned and there still are parks that are publicly owned, but rather it makes non-market and non-private institutions like universities and parks function to form privatized and individualized subjects which then act economically in the ways that neoliberalism wants them to. Um, so I think as you've both articulated, neoliberalism makes an even more deeply individualized subject than Locke proposed. Um, and I guess I'm interested in you, how you see the, the problem of this structural deepening of individualism um, and how it's possible to work when we're working in these privatizing institutions or we're designing them, um, how can we undo this relationship between self-possessive individualism and property? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I think one of the one of the things that I was trying to do in on property was to, if you will, write past Locke and 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 his claims about the self-possessive individual. Um, because of course, Locke in making that argument did not consider the theft of African bodies as constituting the first kind of instance of post, of enlightenment and post enlightenment property. And so one of the things that I try to do in on property is, and I, whether it's successful or not is, 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 will be for others to decide, is to say that in fact, part of the problem with property is that it's founded on the bodies of people who are still living. And as those people move through space and across land, real estate, now mark, also marked as property, they both symbolize the problem of property and are seen as transgressors of it. And that's the harshness of a certain kind of, of policing enacted on Black people and particularly Indigenous people whose lands and territories were stolen and made into property. And this in of itself, um, sits at the crux of why, you know, I argue in the book that what we call our, our contemporary abolitionist politics is a continuation of a longer, a longer politics of abolition in which, um, you know, in some ways it's interrupted by the mid sixties when we see the kinds of emergence of, post-colonial African nation states and Caribbean nation states that get read as an account and a new narrative of freedom and a change globality. But actually um, that is, those are moments of, of discontinuity that allow for a reassertion of a certain white supremacist logic of the world. And, and once, once that works itself out, what we see then are a continuation of the very violences and the very logics 
that underpin the very idea that whole that that others could be placed into the holes of ships and transported elsewhere to become units of labor and to become markers of property and capital themselves. So I don't know if I'm laying out as clearly as I would as I'm hearing it in my head what what I'm trying to respond to here, but I I think that yes, absolutely. Part of what we see is that neoliberalism is a deepening of a certain kind of individual, but neoliberalism also retains the fear in a certain kind of marking of collectivity. We must fear the black, we must fear the indigenous, we must fear the queer, we, you know, and it depends upon um, which collectivity becomes the site of fear at which particular time in which geography, in which economy and so on. But I, so I, I think that the Lockean moment is a really important one, but it doesn't exactly um, get at what it is that Locke himself would not address, that there's, there's other life forms and that the very thing that he is trying to articulate is founded in the theft of the bodies of these other life forms. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I would, I would just riff a bit more <laughs> on this, on this, uh, this point of collectivity and the fear that it induces um, in this system. I've currently, I've been on strike for the last two weeks. This is and this week I've been working. Next week I'll be back on strike, <laughs> and um, I think. Uh, and I've come face to face with uh, the with a, a real kind of violence um, that I, I didn't expect to experience so bluntly and so brutally from um, institutions of academia. Um, but I understand it because the, I understand the violence because it poses um, it poses a real confrontation um, in multiple ways, right? It undermines um, it undermines this economic system, but it it is also, and this comes back to your points, Ronaldo. As I've said many times, it it also is deeply imbricated in forms of sociality, forms of co collectivity, and in building those forms of sociality that are so confrontational to that system. So it is a real threat, and I think that's one thing that I you know that is so exciting about what we see playing out at the landfill that is so exciting about what we see playing out in the 60s are these um labor movements that are cognizant of these constructions of inhumanity and humanity and are working within them in deviant ways actually to construct forms of sociality that are confrontational to this system and so i think you know, what, what can we do? I think it can be as, as simple and as small and as profound as join a union, as support, support these groups, as form these groups and, and care for one another through these groups. And, and that, is, that is no small act. I think it's, it's a profoundly meaningful act and a profound confrontation. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's why unions have been so consistently and deeply uphold since they found it, right? Mm -hmm. As we know, unions are founded in tremendous, in the context of tremendous forms of physical, actual physical violence. Mm -hmm. So that the question of collectivity um, as both an idea and as a practice of sociality is one that um, post enlightenment capital and late modern capital continues to work against. Mm -hmm. That, so, so if design and planning can produce ways of bringing us into collectivity, that's a radical move that begins to set a foundation for other ways of being together. And, and this is why I think so much of contemporary design of spaces that I know are really about winnowing out, making individual, Mm -hmm. um, producing forms of fear, even when it doesn't immediately appear so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the example that I gave of uh, the private security and the concierge, which is offered as luxury, but it's luxury offered as fear. Mm -hmm. um, 
fear that you might be transgressed. So we must have this person sitting at the door monitoring. And we internalize that as something special. Mm. When actually it's keeping in place a set of a set of logics that are underwritten by violence. And there's something so interesting in what you're saying that's triggering for me in that, and I don't know if this is exactly the same in the Canadian context, but I would imagine so, that within architectural practice, there is this, there is this coup that the devil has played on us, this trick, that the architecture, that architecture is a discipline of professionalization. You know, we're professionals, we serve clients. And so you never, you don't usually see unions in architectural practice. Where you see the unions is amongst the laborers, so builders, manufacturers, um, and that's where you see this kinds of consciousness and these kinds of organizing. So actually to be talking about unionization, to be talking about collectivity in this kind of way within architectural practice is a, is a profound thing in itself and, and goes to confronting this kind of thinking of, of exclusivity that we see then play out through the design discipline and through these kinds of spaces that are that are contracted. Yes, Architecture Lobby is a fantastic one. If, in, if you're in the UK, there's also UVW, United Voices of the World, um, section of architectural workers. Um, there was actually another great question here in the chat, um, specifically um, from Alison Villasana, who said, um, the poet Dennis Smith says, imagine living in a place that loves you back to describe a world where streets are free of police and other urban apparatuses for racism and anti-Blackness. The poet Jasmine Bell borrowed this con concept in a poem discussing themes of community care and radical disability and accessibility justice. I love this idea of, um, they write, I love this idea of building architectures of care, accessibility and love rather than surveillance and fear. Do you feel that abolition holds a special role in manifesting these places that will one day love us back? If so, what do you think that role is going to be? If abolition of property demands the redefinition of our relationship to land and body, will abolition deliver us architectures of care? I guess part of what I was hinting at is that by thinking about an ethic of care and thinking about those, those who we might share nothing in common with as the standard for how we imagine um, what a value, what our values might be, is, is about a sense of love. But it's loving those whom we don't know. No, it's about loving those whom we might never meet. It's about loving those whom we might never cross paths with. There's already a structure for doing that. We do that through the logic of nationalism, but we can do it through another logic, right? We will never meet every citizen in the nation that we live in. And yet we imagine we share something in common with them, at least up until the mid sixties. <laughs> and, and that we might, um, and, and, and that we might care for each other. But I, I think this kind of question of um, spaces that love us back is an interesting one. Um, I'm, I, 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 I would write alongside that spaces that produce the feeling of love, spaces that produce and activate forms of love. And I do think then that architecture can, can be a fundamental part of that, has to be a fundamental part of that. Um, but I was also hinting at when I said, you know, for instance, you can have a design concept. Like when I was a kid, sidewalks used to be much taller. So you can you could sit on a sidewalk if you were walking down the street and you felt a little bit tired, you can sit on a sidewalk. Sidewalks have shrunk lower and lower and lower. And of course, some of that has to do with the fact that, you know, people in motorized chairs, um, blind people who travel more often on their own now than when I was a kid, that we've been able to build in design features that allow these people to maneuver the landscape. But that those design features that on one, one hand are definitely needed and really important, also act as a counter to other kinds of forms of social practice and new self the space and use of space, right? So there's there's this way in which 
um, urban design and architecture can play off of different kinds of constitutive populations vis-a-vis -vis space. And so the challenge to architecture seems to me then is, uh, to, and I'm repeating myself, is what would it mean to think about creating and imagining spaces uh, that bring us together collectively across multiple forms of difference. And, and I think that that's a practice that is possible. I don't think that that's out of the realm of imagination. You might call that then abolition. Fantastic. I mean, where, what more is there to add to this, this beautiful, poignant point? I mean, the only, the only thing that I would say is um, maybe those places exist. Um, there's one reference that I always, I always like struggle with, which is um, Kalyan Sanyal and Bhattacharya, who talk about um, this, this like all encompassing, you know, behemoth of, of capital that is creating a shadow and that there are people and places that, that are in this shadow and we just need to write them off basically because, because capital doesn't need them. It just keeps like conjuring for, for, you know, blundering forth in this project. And I have real contention with that because I think that this, there is potential in this shadow space, like never underestimate the ability for collectivity to spring up in places that you, that you least expect it. Um, a good friend of mine and uh, the artist Nolan Oswald Dennis always gives the great example of the trains, the infrastructure of the trains in Southern Africa. And this is like the jewel in the colonialist crown, right? They're always saying, you know, but we brought the trains, the infrastructure was such a great project. And yes, the trains were this system of oppression. They were ferrying workers from one place to another. They were dislocating people. They were turning people into resources. But they were also these incredible spaces uh, of border puncturing, uh, kind of border puncturing technology. They facilitated um, cross collectivity between contexts, between nationalist movements of multiple sites, and within these spaces that were intended for their complete opposite, they fostered an alternative. And that was through the ingenuity, through the collectivity, through the, the abolition dreams of the people that were being you know, funneled into these spaces. And so I think there are spaces that love us back. And I think we actually need to attune ourselves to, to those spaces, to looking at their qualities, to valuing the sidewalk <laughs> and taking that, taking that seriously for what it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much um, for that comment, Tandy. I think it um, really plays off well, I guess, of how you sort of conclude your book, Ronaldo, or your pamphlet, as you call it. Um, and I just love this one portion um, when you describe um, how you said our stewardship, um, this would of course involve a different relationship to property and how our stewardship of the commons would return human beings back to our natural place as one species among others. Property would not be owned, but would be used to advance the well being of all life forms, human and otherwise. And how you specifically conclude um, with a quotation from Sidia Hartman about is abolition a synonym for love? And you would respond with absolute certainty, yes. And I just found that so poignant um, and really as a great way of sort of um, concluding this conversation, but also reflecting on um, a lot of the things that we've been discussing here today. Um, so thank you so much for your time and for all of your um, very insightful you. thoughts. Yeah, and thank you. I think it's a great contribution. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good night. <laughs> yes, especially to you, Tandy. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, I'm awake now. I'm buzzing. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. What a total gift this has been. And, and please invite me back. <laughs> yes. Take care. Yeah, Bye. Take Thank care. you again.